Hi, this is Mick Ignis. I play Horace on Stand Against Evil, and you're watching Pod Against Evil. And welcome to Pod Against Evil. Evil! <laughs> the season finale of season three. Uh, 308, the... <laughs> this this is it, guys. This is where it's, it, it is all... It all comes down to, huh? It, it is all come down to this. And who's... Talking about how uh, how it's all come down to why it's me, Nick, the Merc with a mic, and my fellow co-host to my left, Travis. my podcast left, <laughs> Travis, the god of the pod, and to my Skype right, it is Les Weiler. Let's say hi. Hi! Uh, <laughs> guys, uh, I'm excited and a little bit sad yeah. that it's it's over already. For this season. For this, For season, this season, yes. I'm holding out hope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what I mean for the for the for, for the season of the podcast. We've been like doing this for you know so intensively oh, yeah. for a while. I'm gonna I'm gonna miss it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a very intense episode, like the finales usually are. Uh, it 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 strikes me that the this is how it goes. Like the mythology episodes are always sandwiched. Like they're always uh, or, or on the on the breads of the sandwich here, like the, the heel, if you would. Yeah, and these last two episodes have been uh, pretty big up until our our big moment at the end here, but we will we will get to that. But yes, let's jump right into it and let's start with just the title here, guys, because the title, of course, is "Stan Against Evie." Which I'll be straight up. Long? I've been waiting three seasons. Yeah, I've been waiting three seasons to use to, for them to use this. Well, right? Like it, you, you'd think it's so it, it's so in your face obvious that it's like, right there. I, I applaud them for for making it this long without caving and <laughs> and, and using. Like, no, guys, we got to think another one up. I know that Stan Against Evie's sitting right there <laughs> waiting for us, but yeah, I know. I totally get what you mean. Uh, <laughs> like honestly, I'm surprised that Drink Bar just didn't drop that line at one point during the show. Right. <laughs> like, right. Like just Nate Mooney comes up and it's like it, you could say it's Stan against. DV. <laughs> you just got that pause. MVP. What's that a reference to? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> man, oh, man, do we even see drink water this episode? I think we do. Yeah, but like, yeah, yes, but very minimally. Mm. So, but yeah, we open with Putney, Vermont, the near future, where apes rule and men are slaves. JK. JK. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> fine. Uh... So I think Dana Gould has actually written in a Planet of the Apes book or comic or, or some such. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's – I think he's a big Planet of the Apes fan. Mm. So I think that's kind of where – I'm surprised it took us this long to get the Planet of the Apes at reference. I'm surprised we didn't get one in uh, the actual Gorilla episode. True. So – I'll be honest. If I, if I ever again have a, a close friend fall into a coma, we are definitely waking them up in ape suits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't want to go through the whole like oh yeah a bunch of time has passed blah 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 I think it'd be way simpler to just rent gorilla suits, <laughs> and, but but put on but put on scrubs, right? And and then yeah just let them wake up. All right, Miss Johnson. It seems like your charters. Oh my god! <laughs> and then so you take off the mask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just kidding. It's much worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah the. This uh, reporter is in a, a small cabin asking an, an old woman about uh, about uh, Stan Miller, the the old sheriff. Mm-hmm. And who is this old woman? Why? Oh my goodness! It's Evie Barrett. Very old Evie. Janet Varney under some old age makeup. Can we take a moment to talk about how amazing Evie Barrett's uh, tooth care regimen okay. must be? She ages like, very well. I can only hope that I have chompers as amazing as Evie Barrett at well, that age. Well, I mean, if you brush every day, and you know, it's it is in the future, less where uh, you know our our t- t- dental care could be advanced to a point that we might not even know, know right now. We couldn't even conceive of it right now. The dental technology. Right. Also, apparently, in the near future, they don't write books, or at least Evie doesn't seem to think they write books. <laughs> uh, well, either or, I think it either either or a likely possibility. Uh. But yeah, the, the reporter wants to, or guy wants to ask about uh, what happened with with Stan and Evie's like, well, Stan was a he was a, he was a good man, kind of a grumpy old soul, but you know, like then uh, something 
uh, it turned he, into something else. He turned into something yeah. else, and it's like some. Well, he turned into someone else. Oh, I didn't say someone, young man. <laughs> no, no, no. I said something. <laughs> really good line reads by uh, old Evie uh, by Janavardi as the old Evie mm-hmm. here. Really, really fun delivery. Uh, and we fade with that. We fade out to Willard's Mill present day ish ish yeah kind of like I, you know what i like about stand against evil is that our timeline is always like it eh, kind of here like maybe like, yeah and yeah, like she's driving a, an older model car like I, yeah I, I love the it's not anachronistic it's just it's loosely in modernish times mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it may or may not be set in the same universe as gotham right <laughs> and of course we see Horace, the awesomely designed monster we've mentioned before, uh, being able to be played and voiced this episode by Mick Ignis, a uh, friend of the pod. He summons Eccles from his gravestone, it seems like, uh, as well as some of the other witches later, it, it seems to as well. Eccles is tied to a, a stake. And, uh, he starts to beg Horace to like, no, let me join you. No, don't do this. And then Horace kind of sets our main antagonist for the last three seasons on fire. Yeah, Eccles goes out like a bitch. Eccles, I loved the show of, strength, of, of power here. I, yes, I, I'm always a sucker in movies where where something explodes and and like you know is, is like four times more powerful than anybody expected. You know, and just like changes the discussion immediately Mm -hmm. of like oh wow no we're in a different story now i didn't know you actually had that in your back pocket (laughs) uh but yeah horace showing up and it not he he wasn't bullshitting at all like oh no i can destroy eccles that's not a problem and eccles being actually terrified of like you know the only thing that you possibly could have summoned that would make him go oh crap not not horace uh that he knows it by name and is like oh shit Mm -hmm. uh I, I I absolutely loved it, and uh, and of course the the intimation later that that like we kind of got a little bit of it in Scare Unit that yeah Judy was fine she was lineage of a witch and she could have done something else with it but it's really it stands guilt and loss and uh, and hurt that like Horace uses that to to do this Indeed. Uh, and and so like. This combination of Stan Horus being able to actually, like, first thing off the bat, snap its fingers and do the, like, oh, no, no, promise fulfilled. Like, there, there's some there's some writers on this contract you are not going to like, but you did get, you, you did get it. what I said you'd you get. You got exactly what you wanted almost immediately. Yeah. So there's yeah, that. Like, I, no wasting time. It honestly, it, it felt as, as awesome a, uh, you know, thread tying up as like when good place just handles shit and moves on, you know, sure. we're like, Oh, no, normal sitcoms would agonize over this, this one point for five episodes, you know, while I'm going, Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Just learn your lesson. Learn your lesson. <laughs> nope. Like, yeah, Oh, you're the standing against evil was like, Oh yeah. He took, he took Horace in. That means Eccles is on fire. Like less than 10 minutes later. Yep. Oh, you're the main antagonist for the first two seasons. Doesn't matter. First five minutes of the episode, Done. you're gone. <laughs> like, yeah. Thanos snapped and it him. fully establishes that you have a new problem. Like, oh shit. Well, remember, you know, nuke it from orbit. This is all you can do now. Well, remember in Buffy, like I forget which season it was, the Dawn season, <laughs> where mm-hmm. like where Gloria shows up and then they yeah. kind of have to deal with like, oh no, wait, this isn't like a kind of stronger vampire or monster created by like mixture of monster and science that's kind of more powerful this is like suddenly fighting q yeah in yes. star wars so, like like no 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 you're just you just need to be glad he hasn't gotten tired of fighting you like because you he could just end you at some point you know it's only going to be through like hubris of the villain that you survive the first few rounds right and as far as we know the the all he really wants is Stan as his vessel because like Les said, it, it seems to be a prime uh, vessel for him as we see how powerful he can be. And yeah, yeah there's uh, there's strings that come with that. Uh, and I, I do love Randall Newsom here of just like, Oh, I guess this is the first time and last time we see him in this season. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. See ya, I guess. Like, <laughs> and so that's the, I mean, it, in a show like this, there's always open, there's open endedness where he could kind of come back. Oh, yeah. Everybody dies like an X Men. I mean, like yeah. an X Man on this show, seriously. But then again, there was a kind of a note of finality to it for whatever reason. Like that's what really sunk it home for me. Was like I, I feel like they really committed to 
this was a choice that they wanted clear to the audience. Like Horus is stronger than Eccles and is mm. a bigger problem and, and is born of Stan, uh, Stan's guilt and, and, her, you know, this is a guy without any particular emotional therapy tools or anything to, to come to any self-realization having just stewed for three seasons on the fact that his wife fully sacrificed not just herself at the end, but her entire life keeping him alive. Mm -hmm. Like she took it, she took a day job basically keeping him alive uh, and then sacrificed herself for him. And like him just kind of stewing on that for, for seasons and, and then kind of making his play like this is his, this is as inept uh, and realistic, I felt like, a character turn as yeah, – I, I thought it was really well handled. It's hard to make a character like Stan have an emotional growth, and I felt it was right that it took three seasons mm -hmm. uh, for him to kind of come to where he comes by the end of this episode. Oh, speaking of which, we're going to – I should have mentioned this at the top, uh, but we will be having uh, someone come on for Stan, the one John C. McGinley himself, to talk about – uh, his the transition uh, from from our previously known stand to this stand we see at the episode the uh, end of the episode here and to talk a little bit about the end of the series but that'll be for a, a special a special t treat at the very end ah uh, that's uh, gonna be awesome mm -hmm. and so we see Eccles go out the fire fades out to reveal uh, a stand with uh, with the, the demon glowy eyes mm -hmm. always a really cool effect we get the opening. And we op after the opening comes up, the we see Kevin and Evie investigating the cemetery, uh, in like just checking out all the uh, burnt up bodies of uh, what seems to be the previous witches and Eccles himself. To which Evie quickly realizes, like, holy shit, uh, like, or as she would say, Hachi Machi. Hachi Machi. I think uh, Eccles is uh, is taken care of. I, I don't know how, but holy crap! And <laughs> I love how she tells like kevin like why don't you come to me with this earlier and i was like you didn't you didn't see anything like uh last night no i don't live here i don't live at the cemetery i i'm not just i, I know everyone thinks i'm a weirdo but i'm just a guy with a job no but seriously did anyone else just assume that his house was like right off the cemetery i thought it was next to the cemetery yeah it, am i crazy in fairness, the the caretakers for the big cemetery in my hometown uh there there there's a house on the property like a weird parsonage or something like, like that where, where they really do live in the corner of that cemetery. So, so it wasn't outlandish of me. Like it's, I, I didn't feel like it was entirely outlandish to assume that maybe Kevin did live in, there. Right. I just, I, but, well, <laughs> the, the Denise and him went on the picnic, the, uh, in the, uh, Scott Adsit episode, like well, that seemed to be, well, they walked away from his house to kind of near the cemetery. I just thought it was near the cemetery. The geography, <laughs> like just kind of made me think of that. Um, but apparently he was not, uh, out and about last night. He was actually on the roof of the abandoned, <laughs> abandoned mall, uh, trying to spot UFOs, I think. Yes. U UFOs. Cause you, did you know, Nick, that they only land if you're nude? <laughs> I love the eye roll from Evie of like, of all the crap. I, I love when they do, you know, when the show has a bunch of magic on it or a bunch of supernatural stuff or, or, you know, paranormal stuff or whatever. I love the... Mm -hmm. The like, oh, but aliens? That's silly. Oh, come on. That's super silly. That's super right. weird. Like, you've seen so much weird shit, but like, aliens is just like a <laughs> weirdo. I mean, to be <laughs> fair, we did see like the X Files parody earlier in the season, so it, it does kind of like imply that it's silly. You just made fun of a whole agent for not believing in this weird shit. <laughs> like, right? That was not that long ago. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, it seems that. You know, since Evie's uh, troubles are, are pretty much done, she runs home to tell Stan, who she assumes will also be excited. Mm -hmm. And Stan has like little to no reaction; like it's, it's like it, a dead eye stare. It's there, it's just it's yeah, it's we're, we're getting nothing off of him. He really does look like uh, a person with like like an internal pain. Like if you know, like like not your legs not visibly broke, but like something's wrong inside you know mm, yeah like he looks like he's he looks like he's gritting his teeth through uh like tension pain you know like holding something and uh which i thought was just a great play by by mcginley like a, a great take on that because uh, like on rewatch it you can really see that from the moment you first see stan he's going through this thing that you don't understand yet right 
No, I it he he as Evie would put it, he he we've seen him react more to women's golf, <laughs> uh, which comes up later. Yeah, it does. I uh, uh, I love that he. I don't think they show it yet, but he he sniffs and puts his beer back down mm-hmm. in this scene. They don't they don't show what's up with the beers yet, but he, he but definitely they start doesn't drink this stuff early. Yeah, like he he gets it to his nose and like ugh, mm-hmm. and puts it back down, and and again like this is all just stuff that piles up on rewatch where you. You, you start to understand what's happening to him and that he's just grinding through it because Stan would like, eh, this is the cost. Yeah. yeah no gonna, he's not going to ask for help. Yeah. There's some clenched fists, uh, and, and stuff like that. Some like very physical stuff, uh, going on with him. And he, he utters the line after Evie leaves, I'm not doing it. Uh, whatever that means. Uh, well, I mean, we can all kind of assume like the, the mystery is not exactly, yeah, we we all kind of like kind of know the score of like how these de- deals with the devils work. Right. So it's all about mm-hmm. kind of Stan learning it more than the audience really. But Evie is walking on sunshine. No, she's just having the time of her life. Oh, her montage is amazing. So yeah, she gets this great m- montage that I, I swear to God, like the, whoever is doing the music on the show. Hats I, off to you because scare unit and this one really they they made me feel like bad that I hadn't markedly noticed the music prior because it's so good and it's not like it's brand new it's been like this through the whole show mm. but the stings and it's a huge part of how the show keeps the tone right uh, walking this line between like like a screwball comedy and horror because like an intensive scare unit and and especially here like when the camera shifts perspective and uh you know you have this odd camera movement a little bit to show horace over stan's shoulder uh there's a musical sting that knocked that knocked it out you know yeah like really really brought it home but yeah when it cuts to her montage it is it is some of the best like jaunty you know (laughs) hey isn't everything just great like (laughs) sunny side of the street well i love thing like Dana must have gone to whoever is doing the music. Like he must have just gone. Like, well, I need green. A- I want the Green Acres theme, but I don't want to get sued. Got you. <laughs> Got it. Got you covered. Because I swear yeah. to God, it, like it. I just want to whistle like as it's going. And I'm like, I swear to God, like, it's so close to the Green Acres theme. Um, and also, there's some great stuff during the the, the uh, montage, montage which is just like suddenly she's flying a kite out of like nowhere. Yeah. She does like finger guns yeah, to a meerkat. Yep. Yeah, they they cut to the meerkat, so it looks like she finger gun to what? it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, she gets a letter saying, "Congrats on your montage from the mailman." From Gordy the mailman. Yeah, Gordy the mailman. Yeah, yeah. Gordy reappears. And congrats on the montage. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, most sheriffs don't get this their montage. Where, yeah. 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 She. But, I mean, like, this is just full win. Like, I. I I felt like her long scene of, of really expecting Stan to be more happy about it was exceptionally well done. Like Evie's confusion of like, I really thought you'd be more excited, Mm -hmm. but I was so happy that she then went and like, well, I'm still taking my victory lap. Right. I don't know why you aren't dancing with me. I'm taking the W you Uh, son of a bitch. I don't, I don't care. You can be a curmudgeon all you want. (laughs) And uh, it turns out uh, Stan is out and about as well because she turns around and suddenly Stan is there. Just kind of following her. Like, ah, yes. What are you what are you doing here? And he, he responds with I don't know. Which is not great. No. <laughs> and so and she she, wa- she clearly knows that too. Yeah, she Yeah, she takes it well cuz she, she well just to, just to, she knows of course she can get home okay with no help, but just to prove it she follows him. <laughs> like I love her immediately walking him home and and that we we didn't kick this episode off with, you know, three seasons in Evie's just ignoring Stan being really weird. Right. Like yeah. I felt like I felt like the the very real emotion when Stan woke up on the floor at the end of Intensive Scare Unit, the previous episode, the the genuine emotion there was was amazing and really like, took the sh- you know really brought the show home for what they were about to do next on this episode. And and then Evie seeing him in the chair being weird and not taking the victory lap, and then him t- turn around and him right behind her. I liked that like, like her instincts start kicking in immediately of like, no, something's up with you. Mm-hmm. I, I was so happy that that this episode has like a, a you know very with it like nah I'm tired of this I'm on my toes it's Willard's Mill I know what's up uh, kind of thought process for Evie yeah no uh, someone's possessed like by a demon and it's like oh well Denise is acting sure weird well oh, sure I guess... are quirky today yeah yeah, yeah. 
And yeah, I know that's always something that kind of gets my go-to of like, you know what people act like, you know the, these red flags. And you know where you live, like. Right. Yeah. And so Horace does show up finally now and gets a little couple to talk with Stan a little bit, talking about how his willpower is fading. Uh, Stan, uh, he, he, he knows what Horace wants, uh, but he does, and he, he's not going to do it. And he said that if he knew killing Evie was part of the, was part of this price, he was, wasn't going to pay it. And Horace is kind of like, yeah, that's why I didn't tell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's why it's a deal with the devil, dude. <laughs> like, to be fair, he also didn't ask. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, I, I like that, uh, even Denise is coming up here in the middle of the, the conversation. Obviously, she can't see Horace, making it a clear that Horace is just in Stan's mind mm-hmm. as we see him. And she mentioned something about, uh, building a mini golf course on a, on the cemetery. I, I don't remember. I was like, I, yeah. Well, Kevin's finally got the back part of the cemetery open. And so I don't know why she doesn't think it's going to be a cemetery. Maybe that's the graves he's digging up and washing off from last episode. Well, no, I, I assumed it ago. was just the it was the um, ones that Eccles got like and uh, Eccles on the witches oh, got true. removed. Oh, there's probably from. a ton of empty graves. There's yeah. like a hundred something empty graves in this town, right? Um, so yeah, she's going to build a mini golf course. I honestly, I want a season four just for a multi episode arc whereby Denise tries to get a mini golf course off the ground. <laughs> I mean, you got the holes already dug for you. I don't know what the problem is. Oh my god, you do. <laughs> with, with, Willard's Mill and Golf. Mm, oh like yeah, it. Uh, I yeah, I, I love Horace too. Of like, it's like, hey, wh- well, why does it have to be Evie? And Horace gives this line of like, well, if I if I make someone a king and he brings me the head of a peasant, like, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. But if he brings me his brother, suddenly uh, his soul is destroyed. Yeah, because yeah. Stan's like, well, just kill me, and he's like, I mean, basically, like, I I already had like you'll sacrifice yourself. That doesn't mean anything. Like. You know, like if you give me a million dollars, but money's worthless to you, what I really want is, you know, Rosebud, your sleigh. <laughs> yes. Like, it's got to matter. Mm-hmm. It's all about what it means to the person that's making the yeah. sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the, it's it's kind of that, you know, uh, personal hells kind of thing from the first episode. Like, what's the worst thing you like? What's the one thing that, you know, Stan wants to give you least? And it would be doing that, you know, doing what you want. Killing Evie. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he, he. I love how Stan always mentions like a king and a peasant. Why can't it just be a plumber and his pal Steve? Why is everything got to be so goddamn Who's fruity? Steve? <laughs> I loved Horace is like who's Steve? Who's Steve? Who's Steve? <laughs> like, I mean, he's really trying to he t- he's really trying to figure it out. Like what the fuck was it's that? As, There's a lot it's of cool as good as him dropping Horace. into the vernacular. Yeah, it's as cool as him dropping into the vernacular of like, well, you're doing a shitty job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Like, they kind of, like, I feel like with between him and Duquette, like, with their vernacular, I'm like, they obviously drop in on the human world every once in a while. Right. right? Enough so that they pick up on the dialogue mm-hmm. and kind of, like, are, are kind of with the times. But they're disconnected enough to where they, they're still a little um, unearthly right. and feel like they don't belong, which is kind of fun. And Stan uh, is trying to now watch the Women's Golf Channel, which is the Women's Golf Channel, always showing Women's Golf. Watching women's golf on the Women's Golf Channel, your home for women's golf. We'll be back with more women's golf after this important word about women's golf. That reminds me of a funny story about women's golf. Not that there's anything funny about women's golf. And I was just like, how many times are we going to say women's golf? This <laughs> is <Just laughs> funny. Possible. <laughs> and then Stan takes, this is where Stan takes a sniff of the beer, like almost gets it to his mouth and it's like, oh, what? And dumps out just like oil sludge. Mm-hmm. Right. Tar. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that is either, like, demon possession of, like, uh, you, you can no longer I- imbibe in earthly, uh, what would you call it? Like, Desires. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just ruin, it, yeah, it just seemed like, you know what, I, I you know, I'm gonna, not gonna kill you, I'm just gonna ruin everything for you until you just give up. I, I assume, too, that, like, his TV probably was not showing anything but women's golf. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I think, like, suddenly oh. every TV channel is, yeah, yeah, suddenly every, because Edie mentions it earlier of, like, I've seen you show more interest in women's golf, like, suddenly everything's women's golf for Stan, like, none of his, all of his beers are are not just skunk, but whatever the hell was going on mm. in that can. Oh, well, like, I didn't even think of it, that. I, I felt like uh, Horace was just basically, like, ruining everything constantly yep. so that it was just this si- relentless, like, 
pressure, you know, just well, nothing's fine. I'm disconnected from everything. The, the whole world's worthless to me. I might as well give Horace what he wants. Wow. I, I didn't even think of that. That's actually, I like that. I like that, that Horace might be fucked with him on, on such a level that <laughs> like, there's no other option but to give in. I like that a lot, actually. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> Stan is not given in quite yet. Uh, he, 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 I forget where he's, he does next. He's, he's actually trying to, I think he goes to visit Duquette next, but I'm trying to remember if there's a Denise scene in between here. Um, yeah, uh, he, well, no, no, uh, in between here, in between here, we actually get our only drink water scene. Yes. Um, yes. That's where it is. This is where, uh, Evie's now reading bored female sheriff monthly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Which is great. I love that there's a spinoff mag to Divorce Female Sheriff. There's a uh, little blurb on the bottom that says, I can't even, which <laughs> is pretty good. So over this, yeah. Uh, and uh, and that's when uh, Drinkwater comes up and tells her that there's a, he's holding all his laundry. It says that there's an ethnic gang fight at the laundromat. She's like, I'm pretty sure we can't say that. It's a bunch of Dutch ladies handing out butter cookies. You tell me what to call it. Not that, I guess. But then... <laughs> Like they pack a lot of drink water into into this very oh, yeah. very short mm-hmm. moment because I think the next thing she says like, I mean it's it's got to be his day off but he's in uniform holding, uh, all of his laundry but she's like why don't you go fold those whites? No, I don't see whites, just laundry. Oh, drink water. <sighs> what? What does just, that even mean? Yeah, I I, 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 I it's like that's that's just great. Like the the it's just such a great play on, uh. Well, I, love I don't how it, see color. I, you know, it, it sounds like philosophical for a second, and then until you like think about yeah. it, no, at it, all. it means nothing. And you're like, that yeah. doesn't mean like fucking. Well, anything. it's the same what stupid thing as like, <laughs> like oh, I'm not racist. I don't see color. Like, well, no, but I mean, you, you do though. Well, like, what do you what do you do at a stop sign? Like, what do you what do you like, at a stop right? Like, you, like, do, if, like if, you see color even in grayscale. Like, like you, what do you see? You see something, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, so there, yeah, that's, that, it, it, that's fun. Um, but in the meantime of that ethnic gang fight, while well, those butter cookies are just flying, uh, the Horace yeah, attacks. Those tens can be heavy, man. Yeah, Horace attacks Evie in her car, and, uh, it's a pretty scary sequence of just jumping right on the car, and as she pulls the gun. Which, she, hey, she had her gun. She has her gun a lot in this episode. It's, like, actually loaded, I think. Well, we were getting closer. Like, last episode, her gun was present, but Denise had it. Yeah. And now her gun is present, and she has it, which is great. And, uh... If we had one more episode, she'd shoot someone. By the time she pulls it, Horace mm-hmm. is gone, but he does leave handprints on the car. Uh, we then switch to Gerard Duquette and Stan talking at the cemetery. And, uh, I, I love Stan. It's just like, you tricked me. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> it's like... Duh. I yeah. want to get to go look. I look at me. I look like an uh, adult cosplay uh, of the of the Shadow Man from the, from the Princess and the Frog. Mm-hmm. What would you think was gonna happen? Like, no, I, I, I love too because even his line is like, "Ever heard of a deal devil that works out great?" Like, come on, man. Like, for right. real, man. Have you not even seen a George Burns movie? Right. Well, I mean, like to always bring it back to where uh, where Les likes to bring it is supernatural. Like, have they ever melt, made a deal with Crowley that worked out for anyone? Yeah. Uh. Like, or, I mean, because there's like 16 seasons, probably. <laughs> Maybe just by law of averages. Yeah. He can't screw them over every time. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I, I do love that, uh, Duquette, uh, is kind of just giving him the skinny of like, no, I had, I had my own personal grudge against Eccles and, uh, I was willing to do anything to get, get it done. You were just kind of in the, you were just kind of the convenient vessel here. Cause boy, aren't you a good vessel for Horace. So, yeah, I had to kind of set you up, buddy. Sorry. Still kind of curious what exactly Duquette's whole deal is with Eccles. Something really personal, it feels mm. like. I don't know if we'll ever get it explained, but it feels like it, what he's willing to sacrifice in order to... Because all, all Duquette's done throughout the last two seasons, basically, is prep, prep Stan for being a vessel to Horus. Yep. Like, you realize that that's been his plan from the jump. Mm-hmm. Like, and so whatever it is, it's... It, it's worth Duquette putting a lot of time and effort into Stan in particular to make this thing happen. So, yeah, and uh, he explains to Stan, like, hey, you know, Horace being able to do that to Eccles, that doesn't, co- that doesn't come from a, a vessel that's filled with love and, and uh, brimming with joy and happiness. 
And that's what kind of gives Stan this idea of like, oh, because that's that's what Horace can't stand. That's the opposite of Horace. That's something that could kill him. Uh, that the, the, this thing you're talking about being love, and that's what leads him to Denise and Kevin as they are uh, walking through the cemetery and talking about the miniature golf course. <laughs> and suddenly, Stan's digging up Claire's grave, and I love Kevin's reaction here of like, <laughs> "You dig up this woman every week." What are you doing? I mean, like, it does happen quite often. <laughs> and he's like, this is the last time, I promise. And he takes Claire's ring. Uh, he, he says, uh, sorry, honey, and, uh, you know, like, whispers his final goodbye. He talks with Kevin a final time. Hey, Kevo, you, uh, you're my best friend, right? Yeah. Can I ask you a personal question? Yeah. What's your last name? Cougar Mellencamp? No relation. No relation? No relation. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I also love Kevin's, yeah? Yes. Like, answer to, like, you're my best friend, mm-hmm. right? But they have a secret handshake. Yeah, like, they do. When they part ways. I love it. It was awesome. And, like, and it's like, hey, look after, uh, look after Denise, why don't you? Or maybe, Denise, you look after him. Or maybe you both look out after each other. You know, I guess, look into a assisted living facility, I guess. <laughs> God, that's such an insult to just like, you know what? You two are both too incompetent to live on your own. We should probably just fix this. Well, I mean, every time we think Kevin might be in, like, Kevin's gotten a lot more human over this season, but he's still kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Like, he'll still jump into a, a mirror without, without, while holding the other end of the rope. Yeah. Like, there's just... The survival instinct is still not exactly on par with, say, a regular human being. So or a lemming. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so that's uh, I love how they when he leaves too. Like all Denise can say is like after the scene is like that's my mom. And they both look in for a second, and then the scene cuts. I'm actually kind of surprised Kevin doesn't say, "Yeah, we've met. <laughs> we've met." <laughs> that would have been great. A little morbid, but. And uh, Stan grabs Kevin's musket that he got from him yes. in the puppet episode. Guys, continuity. See? I love it because it was I, – I thought it was such a funny, weird joke that Stan just cold steals that musket. Mm-hmm. But I love it when it comes into play. I mean it's a literal Chekhov's gun. Yep. Because he needs it now I because he's about Chekhov's to – uh, uh, for later in the episode. But not quite yet because he – in the middle of his preparation – because he's getting his wife's ring and his ring. And he gets the musket. But then he gets a call from Evie. And Evie tells him, like, hey, I need your help. you got to come right now. And I love that Stan, even though he's on this mission of, like, trying to take care of this thing, and, like, it's the most important thing he's ever done, he still takes time out of his day to go, like, oh, Evie needs my help. i got to go. And he shows up. Evie pulls a gun on him and is like, why in the fuck are you not telling uh, telling me shit again? You're keeping secrets from me again. And I know you are because I saw... This fucking demon thing, and when I ran the prints on the car that it left in the car, it was your prints. So you're gonna tell me what's going on right now. And she handcuffs him to the radiator there, or no, to the fireplace that she had a fire in before, so it keeps burning <laughs> she him. Keeps getting burned. It's like, ooh, and I love how she's like such a badass until he gets burned. It's like, ooh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Like it's just, just like <laughs> I did have a fire in there earlier. I didn't plan this. Yeah, I love that touch. Yeah, and his annoyance of like really. <laughs> Like, come on, man. <laughs> and and it, it, I just love the little break of like, okay, and back to being serious. Like you, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really uh, interesting here of like, because Stan just does give her the skinny on like what happened this, basically this previous season of like what he did to try to get rid of Eccles. And I love the look on Janet Varney's face uh, that comes over is like, oh, you stupid son of a bitch. <laughs> Like you, 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 you could have let me in on this and I could have either helped you or like, it's not like I haven't helped you do ridiculous stuff before. I let you travel in time and I knew that was a bad idea. Well, he also lied about that one too. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) he lied up until the final, the final minute. So I guess he's just not a truthful person to be just, he, he wants to do everything himself and take, take responsibility onto himself and that keeps biting him in the ass. And I do love he gets, he's kind of burns himself again. He's like, could you at least give me some ice? And she runs into the kitchen to grab the ice and kind of still is talking him down. And when Horace 
pops into reality, it seems like, and starts to attack her. We hear Stan yell, no! And he... he like, Horace, sucks back in. Horace, like, sucks back into whatever dimension he's trying to escape from. Like, it's a really neat effect. Yeah. That, like, he's obviously not part of... He's not quite in this world yet. Stan is, like, holding like him Stan back. Stan wrestles him back into himself, or... Yeah. And when... But- Stan is clearly physically the gate somehow because the the fireplace thing that is like uh, concreted into the foundation of the friggin' mm-hmm. house is ripped from the like mm-hmm. I like the the just torn apart fireplace like no this is a huge strong creature as we've seen earlier and Stan is at his end of his rope as far as you know strength to rein this in yeah and uh, then we get the scene where uh, Stan is is out now and he he melts down his and his wife's ring into a bullet which he just i love that we get a classic smelting scene yeah yeah (laughs) we don't just shove the two rings in the in the civil war musket like that won't blow up and kill evie uh i i really liked that that like we get the the classic werewolf movie like gotta make a silver bullet you know Mm mm-hmm and this is the point where I knew we were in trouble because this was the last physical uh, memento, moment, like well, physical attachment to his wife mm-hmm. that he had left mm-hmm. in this world, and he took his wife's representation of dug up her grave to get that one too, destroyed them both to make this musket ball, and he he is it's it feels like a lot of Stan just kind of like letting go and, and knowing that like he's, he's, there's nothing left for him in this world. So it's, it's this final gambit to try and make things right. Like he's always trying to be the better. He's always trying to make, he's trying to change who he is from the guy making the wrong decision to the guy making the right decision. And this is the only way he can, he knows how to do it any, anymore. And that's, that's where I was kind of like, Oh, uh, cause most of the time I always think like, eh, you know, in these shows, like, I'm sure they'll find a way for, like, a spell or something to release Stan by the end of this. Mm-hmm. Once the rings go, I'm kind of like, ooh, oh, we're shit. not looking for another option, are we? I, I, it feels like kind of, it feels like the, uh, like a, a step we can't walk back from. It, you know, cause, like, if they get the, the, uh, a spell or something and the city's like, oh, I, I still just destroyed my wife's ring. It feels like they, it would be hard pressed to do that for nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, Evie gets a call from what I can only assume is Stan to call, bring out to the cemetery. And mm-hmm. to, to talk about this final scene, we're going to jump to uh, my interview with John C. McGinley to talk about this final scene uh, of the season. And we'll be back right after this. And welcome back to Pot Against Evil, guys. This is it. The last scene of the last episode of three of season three. Oh my goodness and i cannot imagine a better person to walk through this last scene step by step with than the one the only john c mcginley john say hi hey nick how are you thanks for having me back on john i am so excited to have you on for what i believe to be the best episode of the best season of stand against evil like it is uh, been a pleasure and a big ride and the final climax is here and I am I am a gap I am I'm my, my mouth is my jaw is on the floor I cannot even believe what I'm seeing uh where we last left off on the scene uh you uh, Stan has melted down his rings to make a what it can only I can only call a love bullet to defeat Horus yep and this is where, this is the point in the episode where it turned for me, John, because beforehand I was like, okay, well, he's, he's possessed by Horus, but you know, I've, I've seen, uh, shows like these before. I'm sure they'll find a way out of it through friendship or, or Evie will find a, a spell or something. But once you, once Stan destroys the only connection between him and his wife left in this world, the only thing physical left in this world anymore, I, and I got a, right. I got a, my stomach dropped. I was like, oh no, oh no, this is it. Uh, and I got so, I got so nervous. I'm like, they, they're, they're not gonna, are they? They're not gonna. And the next scene that we see with, between you and Janet is 
so emotionally charged, touching, slightly funny, and like awe inspiring. I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, I can't either. When they when Dana when Dana sent it to me, I I was I, well, it was it was two things. Um, I was I was a little torn because it. <laughs> It put me in a position to not be able to renegotiate for sheer four right. because I'm dead. Right. And you could kind of just trans, just kind of make it all of a sudden slide into the EV against evil. And so, um, and I say that tongue in cheek, but I just couldn't believe, look, Dane is one of the bravest writers I've ever come across. And for, for a, a 21 minute and 35 second horror comedy to be this emotionally ambitious, but without being, um, maudlin or, or saccharine, uh, but to really be truthfully, to, to let these characters have emotions is the stuff that dreams are made of for actors. I could, I could tell you guys were, were you, you and Janet are on top of your game in this scene. It is great. I remember back when we last talked, when we last interviewed, you said, and I quote, 308 would knock my tits off. And you did not lie, sir. They are off. I I can't even believe uh, what I'm seeing here. The the dialogue between you two here of the you know I can't do this anymore. It has to be you. Uh, you you hold her face in your hands and suddenly it's like don't miss. And I could have sworn I heard. I thought I heard you say don't miss, son. <laughs> but I think I was equating that with me and my own father. So there was there was that. No, I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say son, but, um, I think as you know, I, Dan has always described, uh, Janet's character, Evie, um, somewhat tongue in cheek, but not really, um, as the son that I never had, which I always not to diminish uh, Stan's affection and love for, for Deborah's character, Denise, but I always thought it was really interesting that, da- that Dan has always written Evie as, as the son that Stan never had. And that's just always been infinitely rich to me. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and then there's the final line of, I will don't, I will be with you the whole way. And then you disappear. Horace shows up. Janet or, uh, Evie is, is talking like you, you promised you'd be with me. And I, we hear Stan's voice and I realized like, Oh man, this is like the first time Stan has really come through on a promise and it's the last action he'll ever take. And I gotta, I gotta be honest. I, I almost, I, I was starting to tear up a little bit just how the, because you know you describe Stan as a, as a man trying to make the wrong decision but always making the wrong one. And I feel like he's finally made a right one here, but he had to go through so many wrong ones to get there that it, it, the, the, the only right thing to do was to make his friend kill him, which was so dark and ballsy though like it's like you said like i can't i agree it's it's such a chancy ballsy ending i i can't believe it and then he dies he's he's got uh, stan his blood all over his chest and he's he's if that wasn't enough he's laying over the top of claire's grave and it's great it's great wow oh my goodness and 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 the 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 way that dana laid out 307 into 308, 308 being the finale. Um, the, the, those two are mythology episodes. Remember, we do four standalone episodes and then we do four mythology episodes. That's the way Dana charts it out. And to make the the, the last two uh, so deeply entrenched in the mythology of, of where the piece is going from being that insane asylum episode is as good as the finale and Maria Bamford is so terrifying and the effects in that are so rich and the little girl who stands with in that, in that insane asylum. Uh, and, th- and then that scene where Stan decides that, that he's going to, he's going to save the girl. The, those two episodes, the, best, the, the two and a half years that, that came before those two episodes, everything added up to us being able to execute 307 and 308. And, I can't tell you how fulfilling artistically that feels for, for us to have been able to execute Dana's vision in 307 and 308. And then to, to know what's coming down the pike. And since you've already seen it, um, 
it, it, it feels very um, empowering and satisfying to, to have been able to do those two. And I'm not kidding. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I love that episode as well. I, I like in particular because it shows us Stan's mind, uh, where his, where's mind's at in regards to uh, Claire and Evie being there for him and Claire sacrificing herself for him and what burden that lays on him and how it's sitting, how it's been sitting with him in this, in this past season. And that's uh, before I just thought he was really sick of like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to get Eccles. I'm going to get him no matter what. But then after episode seven, I was 307. I was like, oh no, he's, he just can't deal with the burden of, of not like losing. It wasn't that he lost Claire again. It was that he direct Claire directly gave up her life for him this time. And it was tangible and he could see it and that that changed everything for him. And that's what led to this whole Horus business and why he made this deal with the devil. And I, like you said, like that, that level of emotional, uh, commitment does not come without a trust from your audience that was that's been built up over the past three years, and that trust pays off in this scene in in such a big, big way. And I just, I would just like to say thank you, and also damn you for making me feel this way. Uh, but yeah, I, I I just thought I I thought Dana was in top form. Mm-hmm. Uh, he called me driving down the the highway in Los Angeles. Uh, about like in January of this year when the show got picked up for season three. And I, I'm, I was pretty curious uh, about how he was going to get us out of the corner that he painted himself in with uh, Claire leaving the door to hell open, or maybe I left the door to hell open and, and, and how he was going to get us out of that. And he explained that to me, which was 301, which I thought was great because he didn't to get us out of uh, uh, hell being populated by or the earth turning to hell. Uh, the way the way he got us out of it did not include the the old fashioned somebody had a bad dream or they knocked their head and none of that really happened. Instead, he made the two protagonists, um, Janet's character and mine, um, satisfy their own. If they can if they can reconcile their own hell, they get to come back to to here. I just thought that was the most esoterically wonderful thing that I've ever heard for a, a 21 minute, 35 second horror comic. And that just set the season off in, in just the right way. And then he told me, he said he had an epiphany about Stan and I'll go, what, what's, what was the epiphany? He goes, well, this season. And then Duquette, Gerard Duquette gets to articulate what I'm about to tell you. But Stan, uh, uh, Dana told me that everything that Stan's ever done has been wrong and every assumption he's ever made and every, every decision he's ever made is added up to, to the wrong thing. And, and for him to straighten this whole thing out, he's going to have to change all that. And is he capable and what set of emotional and spiritual tools is he equipped with? Is he, does he have the spine to do that? And it just, it, it just made this landscape, this emotional storytelling landscape for Stan so rich. And then Dana wrote into that, and that's where 307 and 308 uh, just explode. It explodes. It it's uh, it's it's fantastic on our on our writing level. Just the the way it deals in with the first two episodes, and how that like like you said, it's not the fact that like it someone woke up from a bad dream. It directly affects uh, the the main characters and their 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 actions later. And what I love about Stan himself is how Stan has grown over the past three years to be such an interesting, nuanced, emotionally damaged character. And now to see him at like at his kind of he's like he's at his almost his height, like, oh, my goodness, he's he's almost reached it only to have that light kind of be stripped away from him. And it's just like tragic in a way. And then we see even in the next scene where Evie, Evie has to now deal with. Stan being gone and I we I, I we on the show always talk about Stan he Stan can't wouldn't be able to handle if Evie uh died uh, like we he would he wouldn't be able to handle it like that would be a, a bridge too far for him but I guess we never we never even I, I agree we we never talked about it from the flip side of how Evie would steal with Stan I guess we just I don't know why we just never thought it was on the table which is probably why this last scene came as such a surprise to us but how do you think how do how do you think like Evie having to live with this now like what is how does that 
shape her and what we see in her last scene of like, oh, that wasn't that wasn't the end of it. That was just the beginning. What like what is that? right? So my assumption, since I don't know where Dan is going with this, and um, to his credit, he never does either, and so he paints himself in these corners, <laughs> and then he somehow finds a way out. But he did the out he left himself with with Janet, with Evie, is this, that she does, in fact, as you've suggested, say that was just the beginning. So I don't know where he's going. I don't know what Janet's going to do. But the, Janet in, in that finale, playing kind of borrowing from the, 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 the archetype of Dustin Hoffman and Little Big Man, kind of going back in the, in the aged up makeup, which is unbelievable on janet um and then her her going and telling the the story from that point of view i, I just i just think dana i told him during the season i said i told him i i thought he was tapped into a an art flow the athletes always talk about and actors talk about getting in a flow a creative flow or an athletic flow and i just think dana's in a flow right now and they don't come along there all, all the time and you can't really you can't force it when you do it, it, it's overwrought and, and athletes grip too hard and artists are trying too hard and it, it yields not what you want. But sometimes you get in a flow and Dana's writing is in a flow right now that, that just it graces this show with, with so much more depth and, and, and surprises than it possibly could have unless Dana was in this, this gifted flow he's in. And I told him this. I told him that all season. Yeah, it's it's like a runner's high or something. And I, 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 I sometimes it feels like when a creator is trying to challenge himself, that can always lead to like you know friction of like stretching beyond your means. But with Dana, I feel like it's what like what they did on Breaking Bad was so was similar, which was that they they openly like we wrote ourselves into the impossible corner for every season, and then the next season all was all about. How do we get out of that? How do we how do we write our way out? And Dana has managed to do it every time uh, and stick the landing in a in a fantastic way. And not only that, but hit the ground running into the next thing that he's gonna uh, sucker punch us with emotionally. And this season, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out. Maybe it's just because I've I've recently watched the whole thing again, and I'm on I'm on my own high right now. But I'm I'm gonna go out and say that this is each season of Stand Against Evil gets better. And season three is the funniest, most emotionally resonant, best written, and best character-driven uh, episodes in the series, at least so far. I agree. Be- I agree because – thank you. And I agree because I thought the standalone episodes from Vampire Creek to the puppet episode with the nubbins to um, the Kenny Pillar, <laughs> those were insane. Yeah. I mean the Kenny Fuller episode with God it's insane. <laughs> and 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 then the Nubbins, you know, these puppeteers came down to Atlanta to join us and they were magical. And 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 then I thought um Deborah had a chance to really shine as the A story in in Vampire Creek. Uh and and then starting the whole season, three oh one with, with what Dana did to to reconcile the portal to hell being open. And then into uh, 307 and 308, which are the two best episodes we've ever done. That feels good. And and we worked our tails off on it, and it yielded some dividends creatively. Yep. It's, I couldn't agree more. It was fantastic. The, Deborah's episode was amazing. The, uh, the the guest stars were off the charts this season. Maria Bamford, like we already said. So I agree. Scott Adsit. Chris- Maria, she, I, I did a, I did, I've, not, I've voiced a cartoon with Maria for, oh gosh, years called Word Girl for PBS, a kid show about grammar. And, um, and so I've known Maria on a, on a recording stage, um, voicing this cartoon for years. And, you know, she's, a she has no comparison to her in, in the voiceover world. She's unbelievably nimble and gifted. And she does that stuff in her sleep. She does about nine characters on that show. And, uh, we don't do it anymore. But so I've known her from that. And then she gets down to Atlanta and she plays this character that Dana wrote for her. And she was horrifying. I thought she, I didn't have to act. She was great. She was so great. 
what I love about Stand Against Evil is that no one comes to work at 50% or even 75% or 99%. Everyone comes to work at 100%. Guest stars, background characters, uh, puppeteers, everything is on fire and I love it. Uh, I wanted to ask you about... Oh, and remember, Nate got... We put some more on Nate's plate this Ooh, year. How could we Nate forget about Nate Mooney, episode, of course. Nate, Nate got it. We gave, we gave him almost a B plus a story on when he has to, uh, when he has that stick that he beats up, he tries to beat, <laughs> he tries to beat up the escape convict. And it's, I mean, he's like a silent movie star in that. If you turn the sound off in that, if you go back and watch it with the sound off, he's like Harold Lloyd in that he's unbelievably gifted physical comedian. I haven't seen anything like that. Like out of a, out of Benny Hill sketch or something. It was just, it's great physical comedy that he, he can pull out. Like, I, I don't think I enjoy watching someone get beat up more than Nate Mooney. If that's a, he's, he's great. <laughs> I know what you mean. I don't enjoy getting, watching people get beat up, but his level of, of acumen in, in the discipline of physical comedy, which is freaking hard is just astonishing. Well, the, even the little stuff he does, like the uh, the previous episode where he's he's doing the speed gun with his little straw, like he puts it in, like just a little, <laughs> little like, just like a little thing in the background that like you you blink and you miss it, but it's just like hilarious. God, I love it. Um, yeah, with with Stan passed out in the back and Deborah and Deborah voicing <laughs> Stan, it's just that, that thing's a little gem. No. Oh, and I, I we, we didn't even bring up the. Uh, the, the the one with the two detectives with Dar- Darren or rather uh, Dana borrowed from the X Files. Of course, Chris and Chris Dar- called it the Hex Files, and that was great. It was so wrong. Chris Doherty and uh, Valerie Tossi playing uh, Agent. Uh, they were great. Valerie was just sublime. Oh sure, scientific explanation for everything. Uh, it, the the references. Uh, the Dana obviously loves all the same stuff that like uh, us nerds love and like he it show it shows through the kaiju episode the hex files episode the, the nubbins episode like it's it's his his creative canvas this season ha- is wide open and ready to take all things it makes me super excited for season four knock on wood i want we i want to see where where do we go from here how do we how do we go up from here? Cause I like every season has taken it up a notch and like, I can't even, you got me on that one. I can't even picture I, it. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I really, Dana didn't leave anything in the locker room on this season. He, he just, you know, from bringing Cole shack out to, <laughs> to Mothra to, to the twins who, um, who spoke, it was their idea. The two actresses who are twins, um, they came to the set for the Kenny Pillar episode and they had learned the lines backwards so that <laughs> when, when, when they spoke, it would be out, of, out sync of sync and that they would, they would loop it. They would loop the correct lines and post, but their mouths wouldn't match it. Now those actresses came up with that and they pitched it to Dana and Dana's like, well, do you know the lines backwards? And they did them backwards. So if you watch that episode, their mouth doesn't, it doesn't equal, they're not matched to the lines, except for that one time in the kitchen where they're talking about <laughs> the domestic life. And, but the rest of the time, their mouths are completely out of sync with the words and they did it on purpose. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I love about saying it's evil is that everyone coming to work on it loves the show as much as me and wants, and wants it to be as good as it can be. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that from, uh, from everyone working on the show for every, whoever's listening. It, it's, it's my favorite show bar none. And I, I enjoyed every minute I watch it and I'm going to rewatch it religiously over the night, over the years and only find it funnier. I imagine as, uh, as I miss, like there's so many jokes in the background that I'm pro that I'm probably missed and I'm going to go back and see, uh, but I want to ask you one final question before we get out of here, and that is regarding to Stan's character. So, so if, say, if, if, hopefully, I would say Stan comes back for season four. What do you think? Yeah, hopefully he's he's dead, right? Um, but say if he were to get resurrected, 
where do you think because his character arc like i feel like we've taken a step forward that we can't really take take back with stan do you feel like we're finally right. on the on the path towards what what you have always been saying before of like trying to become the man that makes the right decision where do you think he is on that journey well i, well, I think i think if and i'm just spitballing here mm-hmm. but if stan can extrapolate from if we somehow revive him, if he gets revived, I don't know how. Um, but if if his takeaway is that, oh my gosh, Gerard Duquette was right. I have to, everything I did before um, that final decision of melting my ring into a bullet, everything I've done was wrong. So now I have to, I have to change, and I have to, I have to fit into this life in a different way. And seeing him as a fish out of water trying to fit into this life in a different way, it, it, that could be the material of comedy genius. Because he's not going to be good at it. <laughs> he'll absolutely, he'll suck at everything he tries to do. Um, it'll, it'll be the source of no small amount of aggravation and acrimony. And that's, that's a good landscape to let Stan roam around in. Him trying to embrace change is <laughs> just good. No, I, 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 because he's not going to be able to. It'll be impossible. <laughs> I, I, I would just love to see him try, though. I think I, lo- I'd love to see the attempt. Um, yeah, me too. Me too. I'd love to see him. I don't know. You know, go um, serve coffee at Starbucks. That'll be a disaster. <laughs> It'll be a complete disaster. Uh, what do you, what do you want? Cream in your coffee? Ah, you fruity bastard! Get out of here! <laughs> like, absolutely, hundred percent. I can see it already. <laughs> Um, John, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing with us. Is there anything you want to uh, promote or any upcoming projects uh, or anything like that uh, pressing on you that you'd like to? No, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so obsessed with Stan. It's embarrassing. Oh, I, I mean, I, I understand. I get it. Uh, <laughs> is there anything you'd like to say in regards to Stan then? Uh, while well, you can, in regards to season three, your, your biggest takeaway? Uh, I, I think... I think it's the the best kept secret on television, and I'm trying to change that because I think what Dana Gould's doing with that show is remarkable, and I I can with zero level of BS recommend it to people because I think it's uh, absolutely terrific. Whether you like the comedy horror genre or not, it doesn't matter. The piece that Dana has built and what he's executing is stunning television and that is really hard to do and he has crushed it i i couldn't agree more and we are going to try and do our best to change that best kept secret as well uh for those of you listening this on thanksgiving uh anyone who's friends or family with me uh, you know what you're getting for christmas this this year you're getting stand against evil i'm buying it on amazon for you and you're watching it god damn it it is it's high time uh i I'm so excited we got the chance to talk to you once again, John, and I hope we get to talk to you again uh, fairly soon for season four. Shovels up for season four, guys. So exciting. Shovels up. (laughs) Shovels up. And with that, we're going to get back to our regularly scheduled programming right after this. And welcome back to Pot Against Evil. I hope you enjoyed uh, our talk with uh, John C. McGinley and uh, the end of season uh, three here. Guys, wow. Yeah. So, uh, since I did, I only got to talk with uh, with John about it, uh, I, especially less less. How do you feel about uh, our ending here? Uh, our our uh, we could, uh, <laughs> feels like we're hard pressed. To the show might need to change its name a little bit <laughs> if there's no stand yeah, I, to stand I against honestly, evil. I'm if it has to. I mean, if if there is not a season four and it ends here, this is a fantastic, poignant ending where they they made sacrifices matter they made real character changes just i'm very happy that that i don't feel like they copped out if this has to be the end Mm -hmm. that said i feel like the the tag at the very end of like oh no young whippersnapper uh that was just the beginning (laughs) um is is another fantastic setup because like similarly to season two leaving them in in like the apocalypse hell they didn't go with the you know, Bobby in the shower, uh, Dallas, it's all a dream yep. TV trope. Right. You know, they, they, they went ahead and, and, you know, whether you, I, I loved the, our own personal hells thing, but, um, uh, 
but it, but they handled it like they uh, Gould and, and Co went headlong into it rather than trying to write their way like around it or out of it or backtrack it. And I feel like like I really want to see a season four just to see what Duquette's problem with Eccles was. What deal Duquette made to get Horace there that is now like is he screwed on a deal now mm. that Stan burnt Horace. Ooh, that's like, interesting. I mean like there's 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 ways to go uh you know with with Stan undead or mm-hmm. yeah. or them having to re- like I no show's ever fully painted them. I mean like nobody's ever completely written into a corner if you if you've got a good room full of people and in the the growth of these three seasons I feel like they have more than earned some trust that I would love to see like what batshit thing they do to get themselves like the possibilities for season four just seem crazy wide open. I mean, you always have like Evie going to hell. Right. Right. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, think good. about how many to, of course, to, to wrap up my, my final pot against evil for this season. Uh, I will have to bring up supernatural once again. <laughs> how many damn, how many damn times have the Winchesters each died or gone to hell or gone to purgatory or oh, they trade off every other uh, season. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like at least five of the six apocalypses they've stopped, they started rescuing one another. <laughs> so, you know, so you can clearly keep this going for like, I don't know what season they're on now, like 48 or something. Yeah. But <laughs> and at one point in the future, I would like to think that years from now, people will be t- hearing this podcast and be like, huh, they laughed like that was a joke. But we are on like season <laughs> 48. Season 48's killer, though. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they re revitalized the franchise with this yeah. one. <laughs> oh, um, quick! Do I know my opinion? I feel like season three is the best season so far. Uh, is that a common consensus? Does everyone feel that? Oh, hands I, down. Yes. Yeah, I, I felt like it really. There is there is definitely stuff in season two that I loved, but I felt yeah. like consistently, uh, season three they everyone on set found exactly their niche. Like it, it feels like all cylinders for this show. I, I wish that. It, it, it I, I'm hoping to God that it has a fourth season to just keep this train moving. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Because I, I feel like they've really got it down now. Well, I think that's uh, where we can end it here, guys. I mean, I don't know how much more we can say. Like, uh, hopefully we can, we will be, we will be back. Uh, this won't be our final episode. No, uh, no, no. I have a couple more uh, things as regards to content planned. So uh, hopefully we can get those things done as well. This this won't be the last pot against evil, mm-hmm. um, but hopefully we will be able to do a season four as well. Les, thank you so much for coming on and being our, basically our uh, specialist on special guest, our, our, <laughs> either our specialist or most unspecial guest, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and really, yes. uh, hanging with us throughout this season. It's been a ride and we've had a, had a blast having you. Would you like to tell the people where they can find you and your other projects, uh, that are not Stan related? Uh, yeah, I am, uh, I'm almost always on, uh, the TV uh, and we do once a week TV crit, uh, of course, generalized stuff, uh, not, not just one show over and over and over and over, uh, to get, to hear me do that. Uh, I have my own podcast, the good die young TV.com, the good die young, uh, deep dives into, uh, one season wonders that were just too pretty to live so far. I've done a very deep dive through middleman and am prepping uh season two about ABC's happy town, but you won't be doing it on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I am looking forward to all of that great content. I, I, I love the TV dudes and I'm looking forward to season two of the good die young as well. Not just because I am part of it. Uh, I, uh, of course, you'd like to follow the podcast on Twitter or Instagram. It's at you at Pod Against Evil. Uh, you can follow us on our Facebook page, Pod Against Evil, or just subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a five star review if you have the time. It helps us beat that algorithm. And guys, uh, until next time, uh, I it, <laughs> it's it, it's sad to say, but uh, we'll have to <laughs> see you later, Stan fans. May the owls abide. Shovels up, season four. Shovels up, baby. Oh,